Good morning. This past Friday was uh, October 13th, and many of us, you think of Friday the 13th. It was actually another day in our uh, state's um, life together. I did not know, maybe you did know, but our governor, Bill Lee, had issued a proclamation uh, for the people of Tennessee to, on this past Friday, October 13th, to pray and fast for our state and to pray and fast for our nation. And I, I thought it interesting, why would a governor think there's value in praying and fasting, period, and for the state in which we reside? If you're just joining us during this season of our church life, we're looking at different spiritual practices of how we can create space for God. And the simple idea is, over time, we can get stuck. We can get in certain habits or ruts of ways to connect with God. And so what we're trying to do is give you some different tools so that maybe if you're in a place where the, the presence of God isn't as fresh as you would like it to be in your life, to have some different tools to be able to do that. We've talked about Sabbath, uh, the whole idea of taking a day to rest, to stop, uh, to be with God, to experience delight. We've talked about solitude, the whole idea of slowing down to connect with God. Last week, we talked about prayer. How can we increase our conscious contact with God more in our moments? And today, we're going to talk about this practice, which, to be honest with you, probably uh, many churches or many in the Christian community, particularly in the West, don't really talk a whole lot about. It's a whole idea of fasting. I've been in ministry for about 20 years, and probably in all my years of ministry, I've, this is probably my third sermon I've ever preached on fasting. And uh, I wanted us to think about this whole idea of what if fasting is a, an area where this might be an area that we can experience breakthrough of things in our life and maybe in our world. Now you'll be more likely to hear about fasting in our culture uh, or maybe from different religions or maybe from your doctor or intermittent fasting which somehow always shows up as ads on my YouTube page, I don't know why. Uh, maybe you'll see it more likely there than you hear in the church. In fact, I, this week I, I googled uh, fasting and I, and I found these memes I want to show you. Some of you may have seen these. Uh, Let the hunger games begin. May the odds be ever in your favor. I saw this one. Uh, a fast day might be a little hangry, all right? So that's what happens when the sermon goes over, right? Uh, get me some food. Let's go to the next one. The face you make when people are eating, but you're fasting. Oh, I love to have that food. Or this one, uh, Michael J. Fox, how I feel after nine hours of fasting. You feel like you're falling apart. Or I like this one from Ricky Bobby, dear sweet baby Jesus, help me with this intermittent fast. So what I want to talk about today is simply about what is fasting, how do you fast, and why should you fast? Now my first experience with fasting was, uh, I was in my mid-twenties, I was a youth pastor in New York, and we were contacted our church with the organization, and you were given opportunity of giving a 30-hour fast. So you would not eat food for 30 hours. You could drink, and we did drink. We had a juice bar and things like that. Uh, opportunity of doing that in our kids. So we did that for 30 hours, and on sun, Saturday night, we were going to break our fast. And we had all these things planned of all different kinds of food. When we got to that event, let's just say... We, it was like a smorgasbord, and we ate very well, and we did not feel very good after that experience. So um, that's probably not how fasting is supposed to go. So what I want to talk to you is what is fasting and what is it not? First, fasting is not about weight loss. Sometimes we think about fasting in terms of Lent, like we're going to give up candy or chocolate, or maybe I could stand to lose a few pounds before summer comes. It's not about that. Also, according to Jesus, it's it's not a command, it's simply an assumption. If you heard in the text in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 15, let me read it again. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn 
while he is with them. The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. Notice what Jesus does not say. Then they must fast. Or then, if they feel like it, or if they will fast. Jesus simply assumed those who would follow after him as his disciples would simply that be part of their life. So what is fasting? The best definition I found is from Richard Foster in his book, Celebration of Discipline. It's simply abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Most religions in the world see the value of fasting. In fact, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we see uh, Moses fasted. We see um, David fasted, Daniel fasted, Queen Esther fasted, Paul fasted, um, Jesus certainly fasted. We see in some of church history, John Wesley, John Calvin, uh, Martin Luther were all people who fasted. So it's part of our history, but it's largely misunderstood. So what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about what fasting is in the Bible. And I'll be kind of over in different places of the Bible, so if you want to access the sermon notes, you can download those if you would like. Fasting in the Bible. There are four fasts that I can see in the Bible. The first one is simply an absolute fast. This is where there's no water, there is no food for some period of time. Certainly not more than three days because your body cannot sustain itself without water for three days. We see this in a couple different occasions. We see this in the people of Nineveh when they're repenting of their sin. They have a total fast. Even the animals fast. It's interesting, uh, we see that also in uh, Saul's life, when he has this encounter with Jesus in a profound way, he feels this repentance and remorse, and he has a total fast. But we see it in the life of Queen Esther. We know uh, the Jews at that time were uh, facing possible extinction, and Esther was in a position of proximity to the king, being married. And so her cousin Mordecai said, if this is perhaps the reason you're in this position, to speak up for us Jews. And she says this in uh, chapter 4 of Esther. She says, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this... Uh, when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against, against the law. If I perish, I perish. In other words, we are in desperate times, and therefore I'm going to have no food, no water. We are pursuing the, God to have an intervention. All right, that's a total fast. The second one we see more consistently in Scripture is a normal fast. And this is be without any food, but you would drink water. It might be for a meal, it might be two meals, it might mean a day, or two days, or three days, or seven days, or even up to 40 days. We see Jesus as he started out his ministry. Uh, as he goes into the wilderness, the Spirit drives him to the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days. He did drink water, but he fasts from food for 40 days. And what was the result of that fasting after 40 days? We see it in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 14. It says this, after re Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. So the result of that 40-day fast was not just Jesus need to go to Papa John's. The result of that 40-day fast was, I am full of the Spirit. There's a, there a, a cause and effect relationship. The third kind of fast is one that we might be familiar with, with Rick Warren. It's called the partial fast or the Daniel fast. This is where Daniel uh, and his um, uh, compadres, uh, because they didn't want to defile themselves with the king's food, the king of Babylon, they made a, basically a pact that says after, um, after 10 days, let us eat vegetables and water. You all can eat whatever you normally eat. And after 10 days, just see who's in better condition. If we're in better condition, or if they are in better condition. And in verse 15, it says this, At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So they simply had, uh, they were sharper 
They were more uh, intent. Uh, they had better health. And that was just a simple idea of fasting from meat and just some focusing on vegetables and water. Now, the, th the fourth kind of fast that you probably don't hear about, and I, uh, it was through my study, I, I had really not heard about this a whole lot, was simply the alternative fast that involves no food, no water. It's simply denying yourself something that you would practically enjoy. So I found this interesting later on in Daniel's, uh, Daniel chapter 10, it says this, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. Now notice what happened. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. Apparently, Daniel liked lotion. I, I, I did not know that. Did you learn that in Sunday school? So apparently, uh, he denied himself lotion. Why did he do that? In our day and age, it might be, I deny myself sweets, or I deny myself watching television, or social media, or access to my phone, or uh, something even, imagine college football. Could you imagine that for a day? Wow, the preacher's getting to meddling there. Alternative fasting. It's simply, I'm taking things that I enjoy, and I'm choosing to not do that so I can grow in my relationship with God. That's what fasting is. So why fast? So if that's what fasting is, why should you fast? What are the benefits of fasting, and then how should you do it? I want to suggest four reasons that, uh, that fasting benefits you. The first is simply this, an increased hunger for God. When you fast, you'll have an increased hunger for God. You'll realize something in yourself. You'll think to yourself, I'm missing a meal. My culture tells me that I'm going to wither away if I don't eat. I would really like to eat right now. You feel these hunger pains. And I know at least within myself, I think to myself, why am I more hungry for food, like I am desperate for food, uh, than I am for God in my life? What is up with that? So what that can do is help you realize, God, I need you. I need this increased hunger for you in my life. John Wesley uh, preached a sermon on fasting, and this is what he said. It is not the end, but it is a precious means, a means which God himself has ordained, in which, therefore, when it is, where it is rightly used, he will surely give us this blessing. According to John Wesley, he found that fasting is a blessing to you. And if you want to be blessed in your life, you might want to consider adding this in some way to your life. Second thing we learn about, about fasting is we can experience freedom. We can experience freedom. When you deny yourself things, you have an idea of, I don't have to have what my appetites tell me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says this, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Does food master you? If you skip a meal, do you like, I just got to eat. I'm getting hangry. I need to eat right now. There's power when you deny yourself and just say no. And it's a simple thing. Practice saying no. No. Let's just say that out loud together. No. So I don't need to eat. Or when my appetites tell me to do something, there's power in just saying no. And you'll find that there's other appetites that come up into your life that you don't have to gratify those. You can simply say no. I will not be mastered by anything. The third reason is simply to amplify your prayers, to amplify our prayers. 756, uh, England was threatened invasion by the, the, the French nation. And the king of Britain called a fast, a day of fasting and prayer, for all of the nation. And it was on February 6th. And John Wesley lived during that time. And in his journal, he wrote this 
That fast day was a glorious day such as London has scarce seen since. Every church in the city was more than full, and the end uh, and a solemn seriousness set on every face. Humility was turned into national rejoicing, for the threatened invasion by the French was overturned. Apparently, by their fasting and by their prayers, history changed. Their nation changed, the faith of their nation changed because they fasted and prayed. There are many people who would like to change our nation. And I would just submit that might be something that you might want to consider. Prayer and fasting for changes that you would like to see. Personally, I have experienced God answering my prayers in a different way when I fasted. A number of years ago, when I graduated seminary and was going to my first church, we had a house and we were going to, some of you have heard this story before, but it's been a long time since I've told it. Uh, we were going to sell our house, and uh, about a month before we were going to sell our house, it was determined right across the street from us was this, uh, another house, but apparently there was, the local college had dumped some toxic chemicals into the ground. And so they set up a large wire fence, probably this tall, and it had a sign out front that said, Toxic Waste Site. Now, I don't know a lot about real estate, but I would submit that having Toxic Waste Site across the street from your house, you know, location, 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 that is not good. So, needless to say, our house did not sell. Months went by, graduated, went to our first church. We had our fourth child at the time. Uh, Anna was born. Our house, no movement. It's been like five months. I need to get out of that mortgage. God, will you help us? And I remember walking along a walking trail, and I was praying fervently, and I felt like in my spirit, I, I should do something more than just pray. And so I began. I was desperate for God to, to interact somehow on, this, on, on our means, and I started to fast about it. In that week, I'm not lying, we had two offers on our home the same day. We actually made money on the toxic waste site home. <laughs> Is that an act of God? Now, I would say this, fasting does not manipulate God's hand at all. It's not like cause and effect, like I'm going to fast to God to get me what I want. That is not the case at all. But it was a test of the sincerity of really that I wanted him to move. Fasting has a way of amplifying your prayers. Last thing about fasting I just want to lift up, and this is not spiritual, but it's just what science indicates. It actually benefits your health. Science reveals that your heart is healthier. You have increased brain functioning. You experience weight loss, your metabolism is boosted, you can have cancer prevention and reduced inflammation just from uh, intentionally choosing to not eat some meals. That's not the reason we fast, we fast for God, but that is a benefit. So how do you fast? How do you fast? Let me give you a couple, if you've never fasted before, let me give you a couple tips if you're thinking that you'd like to put your toe in the water and give it a try. First thing is it's a private matter between you and God. If you read the New Testament, you will see that uh, Jesus had a lot of harsh things to say about the Pharisees, and they bragged about the fact that they fasted twice a week. So we don't want to be like that, okay? So it's a private matter between you and God. I also want to say check in with your body type and your history. It's a wise thing as if you've never fasted before. If you want to talk to a doctor to make sure I want you all to be healthy and not have the church be sued, okay? Amen, right? Uh, so, so how do you do it? First thing, uh, four things I want you to know. Just simply start small. Start small. You can practice this right today. When you're done and if you're going to go to a restaurant or you're going to go home, you actually, when somebody brings you food or you make the food, you don't actually have to eat right away. 
I would challenge you, wait 30 seconds. Wait for one minute. I don't need to eat immediately when it's put in front of me. I can be patient. That's a simple step you can make. Maybe another step, you know, you could, there's a word, the whole idea of break fast or breakfast is about the idea of breaking your fast. So you can skip a meal, maybe start with breakfast or lunch, start with one meal and build that habit. Second thing you want to do is simply choose a fast. How will you do it? Will you have an absolute fast of water and food? If you've never fasted before, don't do that. But uh, these other ones, do, uh, a total or partial or uh, an alternative fast, choose the way you'll do it. Third is simply feast on God. It's not simply I'm fasting and I'm skipping a meal. It's I'm taking some time to grow in God's word. Remember Jesus when tempted after 40 days uh, by Satan, uh, turn these stones in the bread. Um, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, uh, uh, I will feast, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank, Matthew 4, 4. Mm, it's in there. Just <laughs> trust me, it's in there. That's a senior moment right there. Uh, so, uh, but the simple idea of like, I need to feed on God's word. Uh, that's how I'm fed. And the, simply, the last one is simply this. Uh, Pre-decide when you'll do it. When will you fast? Did you know early Methodists, this is part of our tradition? If you were an early Methodist, it was expected, if you were part of this movement, that you would not eat on, uh, you would fast, let me put it that way, on Wednesdays and Fridays. And the early Methodists, what they would do is the money that they would spend on food Instead of eating it or saving the money with it for themselves, they would actually use that to combine their money to bless the poor, to stand in solidarity, particularly in prison ministry, right? So that was part of our heritage. In fact, I found this out. You know, if you're a Methodist minister, one of the questions they ask you to be ordained is, will you model fasting within the congregation? Uh, uh, that's a challenge for most of us as ministers. Of how, do, how do we live that? Because we live in the West. In fact, John Wesley, I found this out, you could not be a Methodist minister if you did not fast on Wednesday and Fridays. You're out. Think about that. That's how serious he took fasting. Because he believed it was a blessing. So what does that look like for you? Once again, I'm trying to give you these tools to help you reach a different place where you are spiritually in your life. And if you're just kind of on the ho-hum of this is what we do, maybe you want to consider fasting. Some of you, if you're at a point where you're trying to make a decision about what to do in your life, maybe an even important decision, maybe that's something you want to consider doing. Not just praying about it, but choosing to skip a meal or two to draw your attention to God. Once again, this is not meant to be legalistic at all. I know how many of you are saying, come on, Scott. Uh, you're talking about prayer. Now you're talking about fasting. You're taking away everything from me. My Sundays, what's up with that? It's not about that. It's how can I, how can we have more space for God in our life? How can we allow God to have more full access to, our, to God in our life? Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for these spiritual practices which have blessed so many people throughout church history, and as we even consider them in our lives, that you might help us to, to not just have you as part of our life, as just an ancillary part of our life or something that we do in religious duty, but instead to have a wholehearted passion and love for you. I pray for all my brothers and sisters here that you'll give them wisdom on what that would look like, particularly in their lives, even this week. We pray this in Jesus' name.